My name is Al Vardy, and I like big game fishing. Personally, I don't think there is anything more exciting than battling the big bluefin tuna. Fortunately, the clear blue waters of Conception Bay, Newfoundland, are only nine miles from my home. And I've been a lucky fisherman and had more than my share of thrills. My first tuna, boated in Conception Bay in 1957, was the largest tuna taken anywhere in the world that year. It weighed 871 pounds. But even that fish looked like a runt alongside some of the other tuna in the same school. This fish is just a run-of-the-mill 690-pounder. I've known Conception Bay for a long, long time. I've sailed aboard the tall, two-masted schooners that carry its fish and freight. I've climbed its steep headlands and watched the sun light up its deep coves and saltwater ponds and highlight the green islands surrounded by its blue waters. I've known the little villages that nestle in its coves and bays. And in the summer, I've watched the children swimming on its many beaches. I've ridden the small boats that fish for cod with hand lines and the larger boats that go out to haul the lobster pot and the trap skiffs that fish with traps and trawls in this great bay. I've seen great schools of squid swarm in from the ocean and rise to the shallow water. There, the fishermen catch them for bait for the big trawlers that fish the Grand Banks to our south. I've watched the tuna follow the squid into the bay and seen them school slowly along the calm surface, breaking it occasionally with their fins and tails. These are big tuna, these blue fins of Conception Bay, and each year for the past three years, the largest tuna taken anywhere in the world has come from these productive waters. No tuna landed in Conception Bay has weighed less than 500 pounds. And in 1956, the Newfoundland Tourist Development Office purchased two tuna fishing boats and manned them with experienced guides from Wedgeport, Nova Scotia. On the second day of fishing, my friend Bruce Woodland brought in the world's largest tuna for that year, and Conception Bay was in the headlines. It was aboard one of these boats, the Shamrock Second, that we cruised out of our yacht basin on August the 12th, 1958, to try our luck for tuna. The tackle was readied, hooks were twisted fast to wire leaders, and then hidden in the bodies of the freshly caught mackerel which we use for bait. Several mackerel strung out to form a teaser with a hook hidden in the tail mackerel were put over at the end of a line and dropped back to troll about 150 feet astern. A single swimming mackerel, the most likely bait, trolled from the starboard line. The skipper chooses the trolling pattern. He watches the baits and generally supervises the whole operation as we troll at slow speed. There were two others with me that morning in addition to the crew, my young son Harold and my friend Rex Herder, a fellow Newfoundlander who had come along for the ride. The mates, as well as the skipper, constantly scan the waters as far as they can see for that telltale splash that means feeding tuna. The waters are deep close to the shore, and occasionally the tuna swim right in against the rocks. And whether the tuna are there or not, codfish can always be caught with a spoon or any deep traveling bait to provide the main course for lunch. Fresh codfish, plus potatoes and onions and salt pork, go together to make up a noontime chowder which satisfies appetites sharpened by the brisk salt air. We eat and we watch. Someone's eyes are always sweeping the horizon, watching, ever watching. breeze freshens behind a swiftly moving bank of clouds. We watch the hovering birds hoping to catch a sign of tuna feeding below them. 
And there are tuna feeding. They're surging up through schools of bait and coming right out into the air at the end of their swift upward drives. The skipper swings the boat towards the feeding bluefin. We're closing in. And suddenly there's a strike. The outrigger bends down and the outrigger line snaps free to clear the tackle for action. There's a strike on the second rod. A tuna has taken the teaser bait also. A double strike. Both reels are singing away and for a while everything is confusion. Big game fishing boats are equipped to handle only one fish at a time. Holding a heavy tuna outfit with a bucking tuna at the end of it is no easy job. But it had to be done as only one of us could use the chair. When two fish strike simultaneously, the usual solution is to cut one line and a knife is always close at hand. But, after all, there are 800 yards of line, nearly half a mile on each reel. And if the lines don't tangle, the fish can get almost a mile apart and still leave us a chance to save them both. Save them, that is, if another boat comes to our rescue. Both fighting fish continue to take line. The drags have been tightened to a heavy tension. A breaking drag so heavy that there is a good chance that one of the fish may be able to break the line in pulling against it. Of course, if one does break away, it will solve our problem. Meanwhile, Harold is doing his best to attract attention. But there's not another boat in sight. And the line still goes out as the fish swim on, drawing farther and farther apart. Time goes by, and that moment of reckoning is drawing near. The time when either one line or the other must be cut. Finally, Harold found a flare which he waved frantically up above us. Maybe in the final moments of decision, that flare was the deciding factor because the skipper actually had picked up the knife when Harold shouted from above, they're coming, they're coming. And he was right. The motor cruiser, Whitecap, with the Commodore of the Yacht Club and his wife aboard, had seen our signal and was coming to our aid. The white cap came alongside quickly, and Rex and one of the mates were able to jump aboard and take his rod over with them. Now, each boat had one rod and one fish, and our chances were better. My first job was to reel in nearly half a mile of line. Then, with the tuna within good playing range, we could function as a team, as a capable crew and angler should. Following, turning from right to left, from left to right, working close into the fish, driving him hard, and gaining line in every possible way. The contest was speedily decided. Only 35 minutes after the strike, we brought the big bluefin in close and he turned on his belly, a sure sign of fatigue. He passed close to the stern and gave the mate a chance to get his gloved hand on the leader. Gripping the wire, he drew the fish alongside, and the skipper, coming back with a gaff, drove it into the tuna. When the mate sank the second gaff into the fish, we could all relax. He was ours, and my share of the battle was over. We tried as hard as we could, but still our short-handed crew couldn't pull this tuna, small for Conception Bay, into the cockpit. And so we told him, knowing full well that another fish in the water, even a dead one, could complicate the playing of Rex's fish if we managed to get him back aboard. Then, as we headed back toward the Whitecap, 
our sister tuna boat, the Jean Ann Second, came steaming up to see what was going on. In answer to our signal, she came alongside. And two of her men came aboard, and in no time at all, we had my tuna safely boated. This put us in better shape for the playing of Rex's fish, which we hoped would still be on when we reached the white camp. Five minutes later, we found Rex still holding his fish and took him back aboard our boat, which was better fitted for playing a tuna. Then it was Rex's turn to get into the fighting chair. It was his first tuna, his first experience at laboring hard with the unfamiliar tackle. He did his job well in the rod and reel department while the crew carried out their precise maneuvers designed to tire out the fish in a minimum of time. Rex had been playing his fish constantly aboard the white cap while awaiting our return. And so this fish too was nearing exhaustion. He dove deep, but he couldn't stay down. He came to the surface again, close in. My tuna, a small one of only 550 pounds, was already aboard. Rex's, we were sure, would be larger. We were coming close to achieving the seemingly impossible in the history of big game angling. The hooking, playing, and boating of two huge blue fins from simultaneous strikes on the same boat. Strong hands finally had grasped the leader just 55 minutes after the double strike. And the second blue fin, a 600 pounder, came over the side. Our twin strikes had brought us a total of more than 1,100 pounds of tuna in an hour of almost unbelievable thrills and excitement. Rex had his first unforgettable tuna and I my most unusual fishing experience. Now you know why I'm an enthusiastic tuna fisherman. Tuna come to many Newfoundland bays in mid-July and stay there until early October. I've seen many bluefins bigger than any yet taken on rod and reef. So why don't you join me and try your luck for the world's all-time record in the waters of Newfoundland, where sport is at its finest.